Emily Ratajkowski just said that she doesn't believe in straight people. The model told Harper's Bazaar that she thinks everyone is sexually fluid. She said, I think sexuality is on a sliding scale. I don't really believe in straight people. Last month, Emily went viral on TikTok for coming out as bisexual. She posted a duet to a TikTok asking, if you identify as bisexual, do you own a green velvet couch? And even though she didn't say anything, the actress filmed herself sitting on her very own green velvet couch. Since then, people in the comment section have been rejoicing at the news and writing things like win for the ladies and so many celebrity women are coming out and I just love it. Now Emily has opened up about the viral video and whether or not she was actually coming out as bisexual by posting it. She said my girlfriend came over and was like have you seen this green couch thing? She was laughing at me because my green couch is so big. She then went on to talk about her sexuality and how it's related to her feminism. She said I want to be able to have fun with how I present myself in the world without feeling like I'm a bad feminist or a good feminist. I don't want to be a part of your club if you don't want to have me, it's fine. Despite the fact that they split up back in July, the 31 year old said that she still feels anger toward her ex Sebastian Bear McLeod, who allegedly cheated on her. She said, I can tell you that I have never been single before. I feel all the emotions. I feel anger, sadness, I feel excitement, I feel joy, I feel levity. Every day is different. The only good thing I know is that I'm feeling all of those things, which is nice because it makes me believe that it'll be okay. She added that her son's happiness and well being is now her top priority. The former couple share a one year old son together named Sylvester. She said, I've never had such clear priorities before in my life. Number one is Sly and that's that. She said motherhood shifted her perspective and made her reevaluate what's important. Emily has been married to Sebastian for four years, so there's no doubt that the split would have been hard on her. On September the 8th, she filed for divorce in Manhattan Supreme Court. Page six reported that the filing was contested, which means that the terms of the divorce have not been resolved. That same month, a source close to the model confirmed that the couple had broken up and that it was her decision. Quote, he cheated, he's a serial cheater, it's gross, he's a dog. Although Emily hasn't spoken out directly about her personal life, she suddenly confirmed the cheating rumors by liking several tweets, including one that said, Emrata, finally free from that man, just proves that God is actually very real. And it can't believe that little B cheated on Emrata. But it's not all that bad. In fact, it looks like Emily has gotten herself a brand new love interest and moved on with DJ Orazio Rizpo. They were first spotted together in New York on the 14th of October when they were photographed kissing in the street. Emily was wearing an all black off the shoulder outfit with red books, while Orazio wore a yellow shirt with a cord jacket and turned up gray trousers. People published photographs, adding that they were seen having dinner in New York City and seemed to be enjoying each other's company. Emily has also been linked to Brad Pitt recently, but whether that romance blossoms into something serious remains to be seen. She's also recently announced her newest business venture with her podcast called Hilo, which launches this week. It's set to cover a range of topics and have guest speakers on her show and has been described as a mix of Call Her Daddy and Fresh Air. This move makes total sense because fans have been wanting her to create a podcast for quite some time. Amrata has gotten herself a massive following on TikTok, mostly for her tell it like it is feminist takes. In fact, she was one of the first celebrities to call out Adam Levine when he was exposed for cheating on his wife with Instagram model Sumner Stroh. Emily said, I don't understand why we continue to blame women for men's mistakes, especially when you're talking about a 20 something year old woman dealing with men in positions of power who were twice their age. The power dynamic is so skewed, it's ridiculous. Like it's predatory, it's manipulative, I can't imagine. In a second post, the 31 year old followed it up with, I think we have a huge problem in our culture right now when we say, oh men are monsters, they're terrible, they're horrible. Then we don't hold them accountable. We blame other women and ask women to adjust their behavior instead of just saying that men need to change their behavior. It's sexism, it's classic misogyny. It looks like Pete David Davidson and Emily Ratajkowski have gone as public as you possibly can in Hollywood by attending an NBA game together. The couple confirmed to the world that yes, their relationship really is happening. They had their first public outing in one of New York City's highest profile venues when they sat courtside together at a New York Knicks game last night in Madison Square Garden. They were sitting next to Ben Stiller and Jordan Sparks, so there was a lot of star power in the house. While the two of them didn't have a kiss care moment this time, they were not trying to hide the fact that they were a couple whatsoever. While there didn't seem to be any obvious PDA, Emily and Pete were all smiles and they didn't shy away from the cameras either. In fact, the Knicks own Twitter account posted a photo of them together from the night with the caption, Pete Davidson doesn't miss. The post went viral and the responses were both hilarious and completely expected. Someone wrote, at this point he's getting fine women from the fact that he's been known to have other fine women. And he can't keep getting away with this. Another user tweeted, I've moved past my hater stage and 
and I'm now impressed and rooting for him. What's really funny though is that most of the comments are still along the lines of what does he have that I don't have? I mean a lot of people still seem like they cannot fathom how Pete Davidson managed to score yet another hot date. But Emily said it herself when she described him as a professional. She also said he's got the height, he's super charming, vulnerable and he has a good relationship with his mom. She even said that it's only other men that think he isn't attractive, which seems to be the case. But the craziest part about their date night was during their celebrity attendee shout out, the in-game announcer called him Pete Davis and he actually wasn't even able to name Emily at all. Their big outing comes just two weeks after it was first reported that the two of them were seeing each other. Pete and Emily were recently spotted in the Big Apple celebrating his 29th birthday and photographers snapped pictures of them hugging in a building hallway, probably to escape the freezing temperatures at the time. We know the two of them also attended Friendsgiving together over the weekend. Bumble's chief brand officer Shelby Drummond shared an Instagram post of the two of them seated at her dinner table. So clearly they're starting to spend holidays together as well. A source told Us Weekly on November 14th that Pete and Emily have been talking for a couple of months now. They're in the very early stages of dating, but both really like each other. As for Emily, she's been hinting for a while now that she's ready to get back into the dating game. She told Harper's Bazaar, I can tell you that I have never been single before. I feel all the emotions. I feel anger, sadness, I feel excited, I feel joy, I feel levity, every day is different. The only good thing I know is that I'm feeling all of those things, which is nice because it makes me believe that I'll be okay. But interestingly enough, she's also hinted on her TikTok that things between her and Pete are actually casual and that she might be seeing multiple people. She posted a video of her lip syncing to the phrase, I would be with multiple men, also some women as well. Everyone's hot but in an interesting way. Pete has also been out of the dating game for quite some time now, ever since breaking up with Kim Kardashian in August. In fact, fans have speculated that the reality star might be a little bit jealous with her ex dating Emily, as we know that Kim and Pete started dating after they met on SNL in October of 2021, and they ended up dating for nine months. So to be fair, it was one of Pete's longest relationships. Since then, many people have felt that Kim did not approve of who he has chosen to date now. Fans pointed to a video that she posted of her dancing and singing along to Ariana Grande's song Santa Tell Me, along with her daughter North. And because Ariana is another one of Pete's exes, people seem to think that it was some kind of message. One fan commented, the same day news comes out about Pete and Emily, huh? While another person said, Kim really fired up a TikTok to Ariana Grande after the Pete and Emrata news. But it's impossible to know for sure because Kim hasn't come out and publicly said anything against Emily. In fact, a source told Entertainment Tonight just last week, quote, Kim is not bothered by Pete and Emily's relationship and knows that things were over between her and Pete. She just wants everyone to live their best lives and be happy. So hopefully everyone is able to get behind them as a couple because they're already starting to become a fan favorite. Why are so many people saying they prefer Emily Ratajkowski for Pete Davidson over Kim Kardashian? Let's break it down. Although both women are certified A-list hotties and former best friends, there are quite a few reasons why one relationship got a lot of hate while the other one is being celebrated. In early November, it was reported that Pete and Emily are in the very early stages of dating and that they really like each other. A source told Us Weekly that they have been talking for a couple of months now and they were set up by mutual friends. In the weeks following, they've gone on several public outings and each time they've been spotted together, they look more and more like a happy couple. News of the relationship brought mostly positive reactions online. It even added to the running joke about Pete Davidson being able to pull literally anyone he wants. In fact, a meme has since gone viral on Twitter, which is a photoshopped picture of him next to Marilyn Monroe with the caption, Pete Davidson as soon as he arrives in heaven. Overall, you can see that people are really happy he started dating Emily. Under photos of them, you'll see a lot of comments saying, now these two actually seem like they belong together. And people saying, finally, it's about time. The general consensus about Pete and Emily is that they not only look great together, but they suit each other in personality as well. Even Howard Stern literally predicted that they would end up together back in September. So when he heard about the news of them dating, he said, I think it's effing great. I called it. This dude is living the dream and you can get a little bit jealous. He's a funny dude. He's famous. He's rich. He's got big D energy, which is all true. But fans of M. Rada also remember the time that she publicly defended Pete on Late Night with Seth Meyers, all while he was still in a relationship with Kim. When Seth questioned what it is that women see in him, she said, he's got the height. Obviously women find him very attractive. I feel like only other men feel that way. Guys are like, wow, what's that guy got? He seems super charming, vulnerable, lovely. His fingernail polish is awesome. He looks good. Good relationship with his mother. We love it. So obviously she was super into Pete's charm from day one.
21. We also know that Emily and Pete are very close in age, as he's 29 and she's 31, which means they're probably at very similar stages in their life. As for his relationship with Kim Kardashian, fans reacted very differently to them from the start. They met on the set of Saturday Night Live and Kim later said that she felt a spark between them when they shared a kiss during their Aladdin comedy sketch. But people really began cringing at their relationship when Kim started spilling a little too many details about their sex life. Perhaps the lines of what should and shouldn't be shared on social media was indefinitely crossed when the world suddenly learned that Pete Davidson had big D energy and Kim Kardashian pretty much confirmed it. She also talked about getting with him on her reality show and said, I was just basically DTF. While some people appreciated the honesty, others thought it was all a little bit too much. Then there were the tattoos. Fans thought it was a huge red flag that Pete had tattoos of Kim Kardashian and her four children. And now that they've broken up, it seems like it was a poorly thought out permanent decision. One of the tattoos Pete has dedicated to Kim said, my girl is a lawyer, which he got to celebrate her passing of the baby bar. He also got the names Aladdin and Jasmine with an infinity symbol between them, which is a direct reference to their first kiss on SNL. And he even got the initials of her four children in a tattoo that reads KNSCP. But of course, Kim didn't get any cheesy couple tattoos done on herself. And that really says a lot about the differences between them. But one of the biggest complications of their relationship was her ex, Kanye West. For some reason, the rapper was so threatened by the idea of his ex-wife moving on with Pete that he made it his mission to try and make his life hell. One of the things that Kanye did to mess with him was that he posted a photo of a fake New York Times cover on Instagram with the headline reading, Pete Davidson is dead at age 28. He thought it would be hilarious if everyone thought that Pete had died. Then he made a social media post saying, hold your spouse close, make sure they know how much you love them and appreciate them because there is a skeet lurking in every dirty alleyway waiting to help destroy your family and walk around in Calvin Klein jeans around your children. As a result, fans felt really bad that Pete had to go through all of that because you could tell that it was really putting a strain on his mental health. While it was great that he stood by Kim during all of the Kanye drama, clearly at some point it became too much for anyone to have to put up with. So all things considered, you can see why there's such a difference between the way people felt about Kim and Pete together versus how they feel about Emily and Pete now that they've started dating. Why is it that Harry Styles needs to constantly defend his sexuality? Hey, I'm your host Bridget Shields and let's take a look at the latest story. Harry has once again responded to criticism online from those who say that he isn't queer because he's only publicly dated the opposite gender. Quote, sometimes people say, you've only been with women and I don't think I've publicly been with anyone. If someone takes a picture of you with someone, it doesn't mean you're choosing to have a public relationship or something. It's quite apparent that being in the spotlight for over a decade can really take a toll on your personal life. The British superstar also spoke to Better Homes and Gardens about the impact that fame has on his sexuality. Quote, for a long time, I felt like the only thing that was mine was my sex life. I felt so ashamed about it, ashamed at the idea of people even knowing that I was having sex, let alone who with. What he's talking about, of course, is the overwhelming pressure from fans to see into his love life since he first rose to fame in 2010 as a member of One Direction. The pop band was a worldwide sensation and as a result, the members quickly found themselves at the center of attention for millions of adoring fans. But drawing a curtain over his life has only made everyone who's not behind it all the more curious and borderline obsessive. In fact, the singer's sexuality has been a topic of discussion for years and Harry himself has even called the constant speculation outdated. In 2017, he told The Sun that he doesn't feel like it's something that he's ever had to explain about himself. Quote, it's weird to me. Everyone should just be who they want to be. It's tough to justify somebody having to answer to someone else about stuff like that. And a few years later, he addressed it again, saying, I've been really open with it with my friends, but that's my personal experience. It's mine. The whole point of where we should be heading, which is toward accepting everybody and being more open, is that it doesn't matter and it's not about having to label everything, not about having to clarify what boxes you're checking. So it's pretty clear that Harry Styles believes that when it comes to defining your sexuality, no labels is the way to go. But unfortunately, those statements only amped up the hate train against him, as many in the LGBTQ community feel that the singer revels in the ambiguity of it all and accused him of queer baiting, which is profiting off of gay aesthetics in his music and fashion without explicitly claiming the community. But what's the basis for that argument? Well, fans have pointed to the fact that Harry has been known to wear dresses and actually appeared on the cover of Vogue wearing a periwinkle blue gown. 
And while the photo immediately sparked passionate conversations around masculinity and gendered dressing, Harry didn't use it as an opportunity to clarify his own sexuality, much to everyone's disappointment. He just let it be. In 2021, he even launched his own beauty brand called Pleasing, which has become popular for its pearly nail polish shades. He's also frequently waving pride flags during concerts, including when he headlined Coachella and grabbed a bisexual flag from the crowd, all while wearing a rainbow sequined jumpsuit. When online backlash against the singer intensified, with accusations of being, quote, gay for pay, he told The Guardian, Am I sprinkling in nuggets of sexual ambiguity to try and be more interesting? No. In terms of how I want to dress and what the album sleeves are going to be, I tend to make decisions in terms of collaborators I want to work with. I want things to look a certain way, not because it makes me look gay or it makes me look straight or because it makes me look bisexual, but because I think it looks cool. And more than that, I don't know. I just think that sexuality is something that's fun. Well, Harry has been dating Olivia Wilde for almost two years and they seem like they have a really great relationship. It's sad that fans see this as just another opportunity to label him as straight. Olivia Wilde is set to make her second directing debut after Booksmart with her upcoming film Don't Worry Darling, which is going to premiere at a film festival on September 5th. The film is also where she met her now boyfriend musician Harry Styles. Harry Styles is going to be playing one of the main characters alongside actress Florence Pugh, those two playing the role of a young couple in the film. As there is with any upcoming Hollywood movie, especially with names as big as this one, there is always drama and rumors that spread about the production. This one has had a few, mostly revolving around the relationship between Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles, but also what appears to be an unfair pay gap between the two main characters. Hollywood has a history of often paying female stars less than their male co-stars, and people online believe that Olivia Wilde's upcoming flick is no different. So let's take a look at the upcoming movie, the rumors, and what people involved have had to say about it. The main thing that people have noticed between Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh talking about and marketing the film is that there appears to be some kind of a feud going on between the two. Olivia Wilde seems to be marketing the physical relationships as a big selling point in the film while Pugh disagrees with this and seems to drag Wilde through the mud a bit, saying, When it's reduced to your sex scenes or to watch the most famous man in the world go down on someone, it's not why we do it. It's not why I'm in this industry. And when Olivia posted behind the scenes photos adoring Florence Pugh working, they noticed that Pugh didn't say anything about the movie in return. Some outlets saying that Pugh might be unhappy about Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles' relationship. Another thing she may be unhappy about is the reports that Harry is being paid three times more than she is. According to reports, Florence Pugh, who has been an absolutely breakout actress in the last few years, was paid $700,000 for her starring role in the movie. Her co-star Harry Styles, who is making this only his second acting credit ever, was allegedly paid two and a half million dollars. A pretty big gap for two co-stars with drastically different acting experience and skills. Chris Pine, another big name actor in the film, is also apparently only being paid six hundred thousand. Harry Styles' big paycheck is likely credited to the fact of how in demand he is, probably being one of the most famous musicians in the game right now. Olivia Wilde, however, completely denies these claims. She said, There's been a lot out there that I largely don't pay attention to, but the absurdity of invented clickbait and subsequent reaction regarding a non-existent pay disparity between our lead and supporting actors really upset me. I'm a woman who has been in this business for over 20 years, and it's something that I have fought for myself and others, especially being a director. There is absolutely no validity to those claims. Florence Pugh herself has not had anything to say about these claims and really not much to say about the movie at all, perhaps due to the apparent feud taking place between her and Wilde. Olivia has been outspoken about the film, obviously excited about her second directing credit and hoping to make a splash in the small world of big time female directors, a group that is even smaller when you narrow it down to actresses turned directors. Because of this, many are hoping to see Don't Worry Darling become a box office 
success, though with the release of trailers and clips, there has been an online buzz of people making fun of Harry Styles' acting. Though I do believe that the amount of fangirls who are going to go see the movie just to see Harry, no matter what it's about or the quality of it, will more than make up for it and bring in a lot of cash for the movie. It's set to release in just over a week, so we'll just have to wait for it to come out to see how it does. Harry Styles has been caught spitting on Chris Pine. Oh no, he did it. Well, we sure hope that he didn't because there are millions of girls and guys that have adored Harry for all of his genius and they will be deeply disappointed. If you haven't been following the chronicles of Don't Worry Darling, oh boy, you have been missing out. Don't Worry Darling looks to be an epic movie starring quite the cast. Florence Pugh, my love. Harry Styles, Chris Pine, Olivia Wilde, and another one of my favorites, Gemma Chen. There has been so much drama surrounding the release of this film, and most of us wonder, is all of this just a genius marketing campaign catering to a very morally just audience that would definitely want to have a say in this drama? Or is it perhaps real? And if it is, does it even matter anymore as we all seem to forget about an incident and move on within days? So perhaps a celeb like Olivia Wilde would be willing to put herself under some heat in order to bring more eyeballs to her film, if it meant that everyone would move on and not care in a month. Hmm. All in the name of eyeballs, which leads to more money. It's possible. The newest scandal of the film surprisingly has nothing to do with Olivia this time though. This one is around a clip that has been circulating online and the clip is of Olivia and Chris Pine sitting down beside each other at the Venice premiere of their film and then we see Harry Styles coming to take his seat beside Chris. What's weird about the clip though is that Harry makes a sort of movement with his mouth that looks like he spit on Chris as he's sitting down and we all see Chris react by immediately pausing his clapping and then picks up his glasses. Some people think that Chris picking up his glasses was perhaps strategic as he might not want people to think that anything had occurred. The thing is though, the internet has been going crazy over this and most people are pretty sure that Harry did in fact spit on him. Some people think that Chris just zoned out and perhaps forgot where his glasses were and then he discovered them as he was clapping. Apparently Chris seemingly has been zoning out a lot throughout his press tour and so some people are on board with this theory. Harry's face though would say that something transpired, but I don't know if I'm convinced by that theory. Some people say that Harry's motive could be because Chris sat down next to Olivia, whom is Harry Styles' girlfriend. Harry Styles' fan base is not having it though, and they've been showcasing the incident at all angles to prove that he did not spit on Chris. And to be honest, it really doesn't look like anything left Harry's mouth. Logically, Harry knew all eyes would be on him. Do you really think he would spit on Chris in front of everyone? Mm. Even though the cast does seem tense, and perhaps Chris and Harry do appear a tad frosty to each other, but I'm not sure I'm fully convinced of this one. In the midst of all the recent Don't Worry Darling drama are rumors that Harry Styles and Olivia Wilde have called things quits. If you didn't know, fans thought Wilde and Styles broke things off because of how little they had interacted at the much talked about Venice premiere of the film. Wilde appears in the movie and she is the director, Styles is the male lead next to Florence Pugh. Most of the drama surrounding the film had to do with Pew and Shia LaBeouf, who Wilde claims she fired and he claims he left on his own. Regardless of the Don't Worry Darling drama, it appears that Styles and Olivia are still together. Wilde was spotted at Harry's final show at a sold out Madison Square Garden. It was his last of a historic 15 show run at Madison Square Garden, an event that your girlfriend would likely show up to if you had one. Well spotted in the crowd of his show was none other than Olivia Wilde. She was spotted supporting Styles by dancing and singing along to the music. All of the fans in the crowd received a feather boa, Wilde included, who rocked it around her neck during the concert. I personally thought things were over because they really seemed to be almost avoiding each other in Venice, so this is news to me too. That being said, even when they were together, I rarely saw anything about the two. Maybe they're just not a PDA couple. Wilde was recently on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and doubled down on the controversy involving Shia LaBeouf. Wilde stuck with her story of he gave her an ultimatum, either he goes or Florida 
Lawrence goes and she chose Flo. I'm not sure whose side I take when it comes to Wilde and LaBeouf, but I don't think he would be so adamant on making people think she fired him if he was the one giving ultimatums. I'm team Florence and that's it I guess. But seriously, I think either Wilde and Styles are just not a PDA couple, or maybe it's all an act to get people into the theaters. Regardless of the truth, I wish them the best together or not. Honestly, I hope the truth comes out soon because I really am dying to know what really went down. Don't worry, Darling hits theaters on September 23rd, so maybe after its release, things will start to come out. What do you think? Are Harry and Olivia still together? Was she supporting her boyfriend at the concert or just her friend? Did they ever break up? Why did they avoid each other in Venice? Why are people throwing things at Harry Styles? Harry appears to have been injured after a crazy fan threw hot candy onto the stage. While performing Kiwi at the Kia Forum in LA, the singer was pelted with a shower of Skittles, some of which hit his eye. A video of the moment was shared on Twitter, and the footage shows multiple pieces of candy zooming across the stage before a single piece hits Harry directly in his left eye. In the clip, Harry immediately winces and holds his hand up to his eye while bowing his head toward the floor. As he then turns to the camera, he is visibly squinting, and apparently he couldn't open his eye for the rest of the show. It's safe to say that fans were outraged at the incident. One user tweeted, whoever the F threw a solid object at his eye, you literally ruined Kiwi because he couldn't open his eye for the whole song. Another person wrote, whoever threw those skittles, I hope you're embarrassed and crying, and are never allowed into a Harry concert again. Following the Monday night incident, the official Skittles Instagram account released a statement saying, didn't think I needed to say this, please don't throw skittles. So even the candy company itself made it clear that you shouldn't be throwing skittles on stage, let alone at celebrities. To make matters worse, Harry was later filmed driving himself home from the venue, where he appeared to be rubbing his injured eye, so obviously there was some real damage done. But sadly, fans throwing things on stage is not exactly a new issue for Harry, and it has been happening a lot to other celebrities as well. In fact, just last month, musician Steve Lacey had to cut his New Orleans gig short after a fan threw a literal disposable camera at him. He then smashed the fan's camera and walked off stage saying, don't throw crap on my effing stage. Earlier this year, Louis Thomason was also the target of crazy concert goers during a show in New York after someone threw a chicken nugget which hit him on the head. He shouted, who has hit me in the head with an effing chicken nugget? You're taking the piss now, have it back. And then he threw the nugget back into the crowd. Not to mention in August when Lady Gaga had a teddy bear thrown at her while performing in Toronto. The singer had to dodge the flying object mid-song and afterwards she just carried on like a true professional as if nothing had ever happened. But fluffy or not, considering how much damage any object can do when it's thrown at someone who isn't expecting it, it's probably about time that everyone just straight up stopped throwing things on stage. In September last year, Harry kicked off his ambitious 167 date world tour in Las Vegas and it's set to run for 22 months in support of his second and third studio albums. In fact, Love on Tour has already made history thanks to Harry's record-breaking 15-night run at New York's Madison Square Garden. But early this month, fans were disappointed when he was forced to push back three of his dates in LA after coming down with the flu. It was definitely a major setback because he initially rescheduled his show from November the 4th to November the 6th after a member of his band fell ill. But not long after that, Harry revealed that he was also sick and he most likely caught whatever was going around. On his Instagram story, shortly before his gig was supposed to start, he wrote, Towards the end of the show on Wednesday, I started feeling ill and I've been in bed with the flu ever since. I've been doing everything I can to be able to sing tonight, but I'm leaving the doctor now and I'm devastated that it's just not possible. He went on to say, Until very recently, I haven't had to postpone a show due to illness in the 12 years I've been touring. I'm so sorry to do it and if there was any way I could do the show, I would. I'm sorry this news is coming so close to showtime, but it was my sincerest hope to be able to play for you tonight. I know several of you have planned trips to LA to see the show, and it means the absolute world to me. Harry only returned to the stage this week and was clearly ready to have a comeback after taking so much time off to rest and recover. So the fact that he might have been seriously injured because of crappy fan behavior is beyond upsetting. Hopefully his eye turns out all right and he can get back to his tour. Next up, why is Harry Styles catching a lot of heat all of a sudden? Well, it has something to do with what he said at the Grammys. Over the weekend, he won Album of the Year on his album called Harry's House, which was one of the three awards that he took home on that night. When he came up to the stage to accept his prize, he said, I've been so, so inspired by every artist in this category with me and at a lot of different times in my life. I listen to everyone in this category when I'm alone. I think on nights like tonight, it's obvious it's so important for us to remember 
off that there's no such thing as best in music. I don't think any of us sit in the studio making decisions based on what is going to get us one of these. This is really, really kind. I'm so, so grateful. This doesn't happen to people like me very often and this is so, so nice. Thank you very much. So which part of that speech rubbed viewers the wrong way? Can you guess? Well, it was the part where he said receiving an award doesn't often happen for people like him. And while it's not exactly clear what he meant by saying people like me, a lot of fans became critical of those comments. The speech sparked a big reaction online along with a series of viral tweets. One user wrote, this doesn't happen to people like me very often. You are literally a white man. In response, another person wrote, like you're British and white. This happens to you all the time. Another user tweeted, five women in the album of the year category, three of them women of color, and the white cis male winner gets up and says, this doesn't happen to people like me very often. Someone else wrote, Harry Styles says this doesn't happen to people like me very often. And I gotta be honest, I can't think of a type of people this happens for more. Although there were also those who defended his choice of words and argued that he was actually referring to the struggles that he went through during his childhood. Someone said, not everything is related to race. He was literally referring to growing up in a small town where most people don't get to live the life that he's got now. He was just being grateful. Harry's win came as a surprise to some people because both Beyonce and Bad Bunny were considered top contenders going into the night. Not to mention Adele, who was also up for a possible repeat win. Now there's no doubt that his third studio album Harry's House was successful. It debuted at number one on the Billboard charts and included his hit song As It Was, which stayed at number one on the charts for 15 consecutive weeks. But a lot of the backlash surrounding his comments were actually about the fact that the Grammys have long been criticized for excluding people of color. In 2020, The Weeknd slammed the awards ceremony and called it corrupt after he received zero nominations for his song Blinding Lights, despite the fact that it was clearly the year's biggest hit single. He told Variety, the trust has been broken for so long between the Grammys organization and artists that it would be unwise to raise a victory flag. I remain uninterested in being a part of the Grammys, especially with their own admission of corruption for all these decades. I will not be submitting in the future. Since then, a growing number of prominent artists have declined to submit their work for consideration. Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack told Rolling Stone last year, we would like to gracefully, humbly, and most importantly, sexually, bow out of submitting our album this year. Then in 2022, Drake also withdrew his name from the awards after the nominations were announced, despite having four nods as a featured artist or writer this time around. He claimed that the disconnect between the Grammy Awards and popular music was making the accolade insignificant. He said, I think we should stop allowing ourselves to be shocked every year by the disconnect between impactful music and these awards, and just accept that what was once the highest form of recognition may no longer matter to the artists that exist now and the ones that come after. Drake also called out the Academy's questionable track record with hip hop and artists of color. All during his acceptance speech in 2019, he said, you've already won if you have people singing your songs word for word, if you're a hero in your own hometown. Look, if there's people who have regular jobs who are coming out in the rain, in the snow, spending their hard earned money to buy tickets to come to your shows, you don't need this right here. I promise you, you've already won. But obviously the Academy was not too happy with what he had to say and they quickly decided to cut to commercial before he even finished speaking. But obviously some people believe that we should stop putting the Grammys on such a pedestal and viewing it as the highest musical accolade that artists can achieve. But Harry Styles was not the only artist to spark controversy during this year's Grammys. Harry Styles made waves across the internet when he donned a ball gown for the cover of Vogue magazine. Conservative commentator and author Candace Owens was by far his loudest critic, but now Noah Cyrus is being cancelled for her retaliation to Candace. We're going to break down all this drama right here for you on IO, but first make sure you tap that like button to show some love to the channel. Now for those of you who don't know who Noah is, she's the younger sister of Miley Cyrus and a singer herself. Noah came running to the defense of Harry like so many other celebrities did, although Noah did not handle it as gracefully. If you recall, we had both Olivia Wilde and Jamila Jamil tweeting out responses showing their support for Harry's wardrobe choice. Harry Styles made history when he graced the cover of Vogue's December issue as the first ever solo male cover star. Inside the issue, he speaks about removing fashion barriers and thus what he wore for the photo shoot had to match with his messaging. His look was widely applauded by readers, most of which commended him online for showing that men could experiment with wearing what society deems feminine clothing. Now, Noah really got herself into some hot water when she posted this photo of Harry to her Instagram stories, but it was the text added to the photo that got her cancelled. In the photo, she writes, he wears this dress better than any of you nappy Hose. Hose spelled in the way that she spelt it there though. Now although Candace was not tagged in said story, the image still got back to her and she fired back immediately calling to cancel Noah Cyrus. In her retaliation tweet, Candace said, any of you woke liberals care to explain to me how Noah Cyrus calling me a nap 
It's not racist, I'm all ears. Do you guys love cancel culture? Miley Cyrus, come get your sister. Now, although Miley Cyrus herself did not respond, Noah did issue an apology. In that apology posted to her Instagram, she writes, I am mortified that I used a term without knowing the context and history, but I know now and I am horrified and truly sorry. I will never use it again. Thank you for educating me. I in no way meant to offend anyone. I am so, so sorry. Now, to be frank, I think both of these women are off base with their comments. I really don't believe that Noah's apology was sincere. If no one called her on that, then she would have just been applauded for defending Harry Styles. At the same time, I'm not a huge fan of Candace Owens and her constant need to start fires on the internet. Now, two things can be true at the same time. Candace can be wrong in what she's saying, while Noah can also be wrong with her defense of Harry Styles. The difference is how each side reacts to incidents like this. If you're a woke liberal, like Candace likes to say, you're more likely to call out people when they say things like Noah did. This is done to educate and teach accountability, because a lot of people have forgotten that your actions have consequences, and very few people nowadays actually face the music when it comes time. Now, I would be remiss though if I didn't take a second to explain the outrage surrounding the word nappy. Turns out the origins of the term are a bit complex, but its history is directly linked to the arrival of the first slave ships on the coastlines of the Americas in the 17th century. The likely origin of the term is the word nap, which was used to describe the frizzled threads raising from a piece of fabric. However, the word was then redefined to be used in a disparaging way when describing the hair of the African enslaved people in America. Hair texture was one of the many ridiculous rationalizations that colonizers made to feel superior, thus creating a subhuman status for the people that they were enslaving. Now, this word in particular, though, becomes even more offensive when the intent is malicious, which is why we saw the backlash with Noah Cyrus. She was using the term in such a derogatory way that whatever defense she may have had for Harry Styles lost all credibility. And quite frankly, I've lost what little respect I had for Noah Cyrus. I also recognize my own ignorance surrounding the history of the word, and so everything that I've told you about today has been fully researched. Part of me likes to think that people can reclaim words that were once offensive to them and use it as a strength rather than a weapon against them. However, the roots of this word and the history behind it goes back far too long for it simply to be redefined. In fact, one person tweeted a response to Noah's apology to really explain how this wasn't a mistake at all. In the tweet they said, she literally used it in a derogative way. She used it in context, she used it with her chest, I'm so tired of the apologies. Imagine being mortified of offending someone when you purposely posted it to offend them. Whack, lame, no. With another person adding, nah man, I don't like 90% of what Candace does, but a racist is a racist, I don't give a f what side they on, get Noah the f out of here, and you too for thinking it's cool. That tweet in particular was a response to someone who deleted their original tweet, one that I assume had been defending Noah Cyrus. But either way, Brent is right, a racist is a racist, and I don't care who you voted for.